All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fifth and final session in our uh, gardening Q&A series. I'm uh, Jack Kerr, the event coordinator for Willie Street Co-op. And we're here this morning with um, our fabulous garden guru, Ben Fuda. So Ben, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Why don't you let folks know a little bit about your background and why you are um, the person that's best suited to help us with this series and then let us know more about the topic of the day. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going to start sharing my screen here and we will get rolling. All right. So again, my name is Ben Fuda um, and today we're looking at getting started with cut flowers. So cut flowers, of course, being an awesome way to sort of bring the outdoors into our homes um, in a, a little bit more of an intimate and personal way. And so we're gonna start by covering some basics of just sort of growing and harvesting and some things to keep in mind. And then we're gonna look at some plants that really work great as cut flowers because of course not all of them make excellent choices. Um, but a little bit about my background. And again, as Jack mentioned, sort of why am I the person talking to you about this? Um, so I've been working now in public gardens for a little over 10 years. And these are a sampling of some of the gardens I've worked uh, from you know across the Midwest here predominantly. Um, sort of Chicagoland region. Um, most recently, the Allen Centennial Garden at UW-Madison, which is how I've uh, come to connect with Willie Street Co-op and all of you. Um, but I'm now based in South Bend, Indiana, which is our hometown. And so I am uh, in the process of rebuilding and remaking a new home garden for us here. Um, but that said, you know, cut flowers are something I've enjoyed doing, um, you know, again, over the years um, in, in small, batches, you know, never necessarily on the scale of a flower farm. But again, I think you don't really necessarily need a ton of space uh, in order to really make something like this happen. And, you know, the other piece I'll say is that even your established gardens can be seen as cut flower garden spaces, which is something we'll talk about a little bit deeper in detail. Um, but if you'd like to follow along with any of my own botanical adventures, uh, my Instagram handle is there, Botany or Bust, uh, and my website as well, botanyourbust.com. All right, so if you are thinking about doing cut flowers, a few things to consider and keep in mind. Uh, the first is that, especially if you're growing annuals, um, cut flowers are most productive when you're harvesting regularly. So this may feel kind of counterintuitive, but if you're, if you're doing uh, sort of cut flowers, I'll say um, appropriately, for lack of a better term, I suppose, um, you actually won't see that many flowers in your garden because one of the best times to cut is when things are just beginning to open, of course, so that you can get the most enjoyment out of them when they're in a vase indoors. So any space that you had designated explicitly for cut flowers, uh, again, actually won't necessarily be this super colorful, amazing space because you'll be cutting those to bring indoors. Um, so just something to keep in mind that it is really more of, if you're, again, dedicating a space to doing this, it is a productive space. Um, so think of it uh, in that way. I don't know that I've necessarily put a cut flower only garden as your front and center display piece. Again, unless you're prepared and willing to let some flowers complete their bloom cycle in, in full. The caveat of this, of course, is that some flowers, especially a lot of our annuals and sort of seasonal plants, they need to be harvested regularly to promote them to continue flowering because annual plants will complete their life cycle in a single year. And if they're allowed to begin to set seed, they have sort of reached the, the pinnacle of their existence. That is their purpose to exist. And so if they, if the flowers have gotten to that point, they will stop producing flowers and put all of their energy into seeds. But if we continue to harvest, we continue to sort of cut away, they will keep pushing flowers because again, they're trying to produce those seeds. So things like cosmos, zinnias, and dahlias are good examples of things that really need this regular attention. Um, Again, uh, perennials uh, also do well as cut flowers, and I would argue, um, you know, are kind of a nice way to, uh, you know, most sort of seasonal cut flowers, again, like those cosmosinias and dahlias, those come sort of at least midsummer and then sort of beyond. But, you know, from this period right now, you know, sort of spring through midsummer, what can we really lean on? And perennials are a great way to, to do this because a lot of them will bloom earlier, whether you're doing bulbs like daffodils and tulips and allium or uh, things like peonies and iris, you know, those are all sort of tried and true cut flowers that will come on for us in May and, and really strong. The difference of course, is that um, these sort of have one period of bloom. So, you know, peonies will bloom in May and then maybe early June and they're pretty much done. There is no rebloom. They, if, you know, no matter how much you harvest, they won't push more flowers. They're a one and done bloom for the year. So it's a limited bloom window in that way. It's not something that will keep producing for several weeks 
but again, it's a way to sort of incorporate um, things you can, and again, a peony, unless you're doing cut flower farming as a business, um, you probably aren't going to totally cut every bud off of your peonies to begin with. Um, maybe you'll take 30% and leave the rest to enjoy. So in that way, perennials can work in a more display ornamental setting um, because it's, it's, it's sort of doing both a little bit versus saying these are strictly plants for production of cut flowers. So how do you actually, I, you know, we'll cover again a few plants that are sort of tried and true, um, you know, and a few interesting things as well as cut flowers. But if you're just walking around your garden and you're wondering if something might work as a cut flower, uh, a few things to, to sort of look for, keep in mind. The first are sturdier stems. And so these, um, you know, there are, if you just even sort of, if you try to bend a stem out in your garden, fleshy stems as we'll call them um, can sort of bend and come right back without you know obviously do this gently don't just sort of rip um, <laughs> you know unless you're prepared to cut off that stem but um, you know those sturdier stems will likely break or snap much easier um, than one of those fleshier stems and not only do those sturdier stems help with um, arranging so you know we want them to stand up in a vase and not flop over um, but it helps us to sort of put them together with other flowers if, if that's what we're doing um, you know, we're, you know, sometimes even this can be a little bit of a deceiving um, or, or not, you know, a hundred percent accurate way to distinguish what cuts well. Um, so another way to look at it is just try something, you know, just do one stem of something and put it in a vase and see what happens. And if it holds up for a decent amount of time, well, there you have a new plant you can sort of look to for cutting material. Another thing that's important to mention um, that I don't have listed on here necessarily, but is that the time of year matters for a lot of these things. So for instance, when plants are in that really sort of fleshy, fresh stage, um, again, they typically don't cut as well because that means they're in a more active state of growth, if they're, especially if they're just emerging in spring. So as an example of this, I'll use hellebores. Hellebores uh, you know, have been blooming for us for easily a month in, in most cases. Um, and what you actually, you know, when hellebores first emerge in, you know, late March, early April, um, you know, they're stunning, they're, they're beautiful, um, but they're extremely delicate. And again, they're, they're very fresh. But actually what we see on hellebores as sort of the color, um, they look like petals, but they are actually modified leaves. So they are not the actual flower petals themselves. And because of this, um, as the plant ages and as the plant begins to develop seeds, um, those leaves, they lose a, their color will change a little bit from when they first emerge. However, they will hold up much better for you in a vase as those stems again begin to get a bit woodier and, and um, uh, sturdier essentially. Um, but a way to sort of check for this is to look on the inside of your hellebore blossom and when you see seed pods starting to form, um, so just little sort of balloon-like shapes, that's when you know you are in the clear to harvest and they should hold up for you pretty well. So again, do some experimenting. That's just one example, again, of timing matters. You know, two weeks earlier, they would not have held up in a vase very well versus um, today. So do some experimenting, try some things out. Uh, even if it's something you don't see listed or, or marketed as a traditional cut flower, doesn't mean it may not work. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, again, there are plants that we sort of refer to as cut and come again. And these typically are our annuals. Again, not our perennials, but these are the annual plants that we'll plant each year. And these, uh, again, as the name implies, and we talked about in the last slide, as we cut them, they will continue to produce more flowers. And so it's actually, again, important to keep doing this so they do keep producing and they will just go for a long period of time. And these are, again, the, the reason they are great cut flowers is this sort of continuous production of blooms, which you can then add to those more specialty perennial uh, blossoms, which you may only get one harvest out of um, in a particular season. So in terms of, again, keeping the display moving, we've talked about this a little bit, but a few more sort of details to cover here. Um, think about, for, especially if you're doing annual crops, um, plant in succession. So even with those cut and come again plants, eventually they get tired. You know, they're, if they're continuously producing flowers and they're never setting seed, that takes a lot of energy. Um, and so it, eventually they will just sort of get worn out and they just won't be producing as heavily or the flowers will be a lot smaller. And so think about planting succession crops, you know, like you would with lettuce or green beans. You don't, you know, nobody can eat uh, 18 pounds of lettuce in one week, just as nobody can eat, you know, 18 pounds of green beans in one week. And so we typically will plant these types of uh, edible crops maybe every two to three weeks so that we have a staggered harvest and it extends our season. The same is true for cut flowers. So if you maybe started seeds indoors already, this could be seen as your first crop. 
Um, we're coming up on our frost-free date here, May 15th uh, approximately. Um, so after that date, you could sow another crop actually outdoors directly in the ground. And that could be your second harvest that maybe takes you all the way through the first frost at the end of the year. So again, thinking about um, that succession planting, but also annuals in particular, again, they're, they're very hungry. They're doing a lot of production of flowers and, and so forth. So adding compost to your soil before planting is a great way to sort of give them the energy they need every year to keep producing. Again, veggies are, are, are similar. They need a lot of great nutrients to sort of keep, uh, keep doing what they need to do. Um, and so they are hungry plants. Perennials on the other hand are typically a little, you know, if, especially if we're choosing the right plant for the place we have, typically won't be as nutrient hungry. You know, you can always give your plants a little boost, but they won't need it for production quite so much as the annual flowers will. I mentioned this a bit earlier, but leaning on those perennials and bulbs for the early season interest. Again, if you're saying, well, what can I cut right now? Um, daffodils, tulips, again, having things like peonies and salvia ready to go are great ways to sort of give you something to cut early in the season. Um, and another fun fact about peonies is that when they're in bud, um, when they're those sort of nice tight balls, um, as they begin to open, you'll see little bits of color poking through before the flower fully unfurls. You can cut the buds at, cut your stems rather at that stage, put them in the refrigerator and they will hold for several weeks. And then when you're ready for them to flower, pull them out where it's warm again and they will fully open up. But you have to wait until you see that little bit of color on the bud before you do that cutting. If you cut it when it's still green, they probably won't open for you. So again, timing really matters, but if you're watching these things closely, that's another way to extend your season is even when you're de dealing with perennials, cutting them at that particular time period, putting them in a refrigerator can extend um, how long you're able to enjoy those particular flowers. You also can lean on shrubs for early spring interest. And so things like forsythia, which are the yellow bushes that you're probably seeing around your neighborhoods right now, lilacs, which are just beginning to come on, you know, they're, they're, their buds are out, but they're not quite blooming yet. Um, you certainly can, you know, uh, pussy willows we see, you know, often in the farmer's markets and the stores very early spring. These are all things that you can grow at home and harvest yourself. And also for the forsythia and the pussy willows in particular, you can force them. So even in January and February, you can go out, cut some stems, put them in a vase indoors, and within maybe three to four weeks, they will be in full bloom even in February. So this is a really nice way to even extend your season further with some of these, um, again, sort of shrubs and woody selections. Um, again, with things like lilacs in particular, again, they can cut well, but they tend to have a little bit of a shorter vase life just because those woodier stems are, you know, they, they just don't hold up quite so well um, as some of our annuals or perennials do when we're bringing them inside. A trick though, to sort of help maximize your success is if you're again, doing something like um, uh, lilacs in particular, when you're cutting, first of all, make sure you're cutting with a very sharp um, pair of pruners. If you are cutting and you're noticing it, it's not cutting all the way through on your first cut, first of all, that means you need to sharpen your pruners, but what that's essentially doing is smushing the stem rather than slicing it. And all of the little sort of capillaries and veins essentially that are in that plant stem that it needs to soak up water and nutrients from the vase to keep looking good gets smushed also in the process. And so that'll shorten the lifespan of your, of your cut flowers. So make sure that whatever you're using to harvest and prune is extremely sharp. And again, for woody selections, don't cut, if this is, let's pretend my arm is the stem, don't cut perpendicular, cut if you can at about a 45 degree angle. And so what this does is it increases the surface area by just a little bit, but it's, it's significant enough to, again, help extend your, your vase life just a little bit. So um, instead of cutting like this, cut at about, again, a 45 degree angle. So which leads us then to harvesting. So thinking about um, our basics of when we actually, uh, how to go about harvesting. Again, I've mentioned, I've said it before, I'll say it again, harvest regularly for annuals in particular. They need that constant harvesting to keep flowering and not setting seed. Now, if you are getting to the end of your season and you actually want the plants to produce seed, um, you wanna save your own seed so you can plant it again next year and save some money, by all means, stop harvesting. You know, that's totally fine. Um, if that's one of your goals, just stop cutting and you should get to that point. Um, but in terms of time of day, that also matters when we're cutting. So doing early morning or late, uh, late in the day, you know, at dusk as the sun is going down, we really wanna avoid the hottest part of the day as much as we can. Uh, plants, especially when it's really warm outside in the high summer, can lose water through their leaves. Um, and, uh, you know, the plant is sort of pumping up water from the plant roots to sort of keep everything together up top. And if we cut at the wrong time, 
uh, it, it'll just stress out, A, it'll stress out the mother plant, what, whatever we're cutting from, but it also will stress out the cut flowers uh, pretty significantly. And while you might be able to get away with it, um, they will have a shorter base life most likely as a result. So again, aiming for early morning or late in the day, again, when you're not in direct sun uh, or the sun is you know, really hot and beating down. But another trick is to have a cool bucket, not ice, you don't wanna put ice in this necessarily, but a bucket of cool water standing by. So, you know, I've even been guilty of this where I'll say, oh, I'll just run out and grab a quick bouquet and it takes me 15 to 20 minutes and I'm walking around with a bunch of cut stems in my hand, um, you know, for that amount of time or I'm laying them on the ground to, to think about arranging them. But really, even those 15 to 20 minutes, especially in summer, can be detrimental to freshly cut stems. So even just having your vase with you that you want to arrange in or a small bucket of cool water and even, you know, you don't have to actually be putting them together in an artistic way in the vase while you're cutting them, but just having it there so that the moment you cut it goes right into water. I mean, just, you know, boom, boom, one into the other. That will help tremendously. Um, if you're cutting on a particularly warm day, you know, some evenings in the summer can be 85 degrees at nine o'clock at night. Um, if you're cutting at that point in time, maybe letting those stems rest in a vase for a day or two before you actually do your arranging can also be helpful because the arranging process of you know, pulling things out and sticking things in and shoving things around. Um, you know, it, it may not seem like it's that much for plants, but you know, anything we can do to um, sort of stress them out as, you know, stress them out as little as possible will help with extending the base life. All right. So that, those are some of our harvesting and growing basics. So now we're gonna switch gears and look at a few plants that really work well for doing cut flowers. We're gonna look at uh, annuals first, then we're gonna look at a few bulbs that we can grow that are seasonal and tender bulbs that are more of summer producers. And then we're gonna look at some perennials in, in the very uh, final piece here. So first up, sort of the poster child, I think of cut flowers are zinnias. Zinnias come in a range of colors. They're extremely easy to grow from seed. They're very forgiving in that way. Um, and again, they, as you cut them, will just keep coming. Um, you know, they, they'll just keep on producing. And so these are need, you know, on all of these plants for the most part need full sun that I'm covering here today. But that said there, you know, you certainly can't, you know, a lot of people will use hosta leaves as a sort of a foliage and, and a filler um, in their arrangements. I've seen other people use things like uh, Hakoni grass, which is another um, shade loving ornamental grass, cuts beautifully, holds for a really long time in a vase. So, you know, just because we're looking at some things for full sun doesn't mean there aren't things in shade that you can't cut. Again, sunflowers, we've probably all seen them on the farmer's market. Um, same rules apply, cut them often, cut them when they're in, uh, sort of just beginning to open um, to really get the longest base life, base life out of them. For sunflowers in particular, they can be really top heavy. And especially if you're growing for cut flowers, giving them a little bit of extra support is not a bad idea. You know, if we have a uh, strong, you know, uh, thunderstorm come through or some heavy rains, it can knock our stems over or break stems off. And so giving them a little extra support can be really beneficial. One that you may or may not be familiar with, but I think, um, you know, more people should be familiar with is amaranth. This is just one variety called Hopi Red Dye. Um, but if you go to, um, I believe it's Select Seeds is the seed company, they have, you know, maybe half a dozen or more varieties of amaranth available from orange to green to sort of a, you know, chartreuse golden yellow, pink, um, again, this sort of burgundy reddish color, um, but they just sort of have this almost, you know, alien look to them. No two are the same. Um, they really make a statement in, in a cut piece and also just in the garden itself. Again, these are annuals and sort of a note of caution, these in particular, if allowed to go too late, can reseed and you will just sort of have, you will, you will just have them coming back in your garden year after year, which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you really like them, this is your cutting garden space. Um, so having these reseeding annuals may be good for you. And this is something you want, but just know that you may have to do some editing to keep them in check if you allow them to go to seed. But if you harvest them when they're just blooming, they haven't begun to set seed yet, um, that should be less of a concern for you. Um, this also is an edible grain. So this is an ancient grain. Um, and so if you wanted to grow amaranth for cut flowers and for production of eating, you could do both of these together. And again, you can tell just by looking at this image, there's a few that are sort of flopping and leaning. You know, they have thick and sturdy stems, but again, a, one big winter or a winter storm, huh, one big thunderstorm comes through in the summer and some of these could be knocked over on the ground. So when they're getting up to this height, giving them that extra little bit of support 
you know, again, isn't a bad idea. And our final annual for the list are snapdragons. Again, these are a tried and true, easy to find uh, garden plant, really appreciates hot, dry conditions in full sun. And again, the more you clip, the better they will do. And something that I uh, should have mentioned um, for a lot of these is that even going back to something like say the amaranth or the sunflowers or even zinnias, if you're growing these things from seed, um, when they get to about six to eight inches tall, if you just nip off the very top, so we'll pretend that this pen is our, the top of our growing plant, we're just gonna nip off the very top growing point. And one of the reasons we do this, and again, it may seem counterintuitive, although well, we want this plant to grow, but when we nip things off like that, um, it essentially encourages lateral growth. So instead of just having one big, thick, straight stem, um, we're essentially encouraging branching. And each one of those branches can then have its own set of flowers. And the more we cut from those branches, the more flowers they produce. But also, if we're, if, when we're doing this when the plant is only, you know, again, eight, six to eight, maybe 10 inches tall, that bottom stem will almost become like a tree trunk. It'll be so much more sturdy than if we had this really long spindly thing. So what will happen when you do this is it, it'll, um, you know, it might delay your, if you didn't pinch back, um, you know, you might have flowers a week or two sooner. So it, it will delay your flowering just a bit because then the plant has to sort of change direction and put the energy out into those lateral shoots. Um, but again, you'll get more flower production. Your plants will probably be more stable um, and probably less likely to, to flop over um, if they, again, are sort of growing in that way. So important, helpful safety tip. So next up, we're gonna switch gear and look at two summer bulbs. So these are tender bulbs that need to be sort of dug up in the fall and either overwintered and brought inside or buy new ones every year if you're sometimes like me and you're out of energy at the end of the year and you just let them stay in the ground. So, um, but dahlias again are one of those plants that again is a, a sort of a, a, a poster child for that peak summer cut flower moment. Um, the other thing I'll mention about a lot of these cut flowers is that of course, these aren't things that you usually find in most floral shops because they are so seasonal and they also don't really travel well. You know, most of our traditional floral cut flowers like um, carnations and roses and baby's breath, that can all be harvested, packed into a box and be good to go for a while. So they can travel further distances. Of course, there's a much larger carbon footprint with that. You know, if you're interested in more of this movement, I'd really encourage you to um, look into what's called the slow flower movement. So we've all heard about, you know, probably slow food at some point, you know, sourcing food locally as much as we can. Um, but the slow flower movement is also very much, uh, you know, active and alive and similar to supporting small and local growers um, of food, do the same for your flowers and, um, you know, the, these beautiful things, not just edible things. But dahlias again are one of those things which are so delicate that we can't just pack them, put them in a crate and ship them across the country. So it really is, these do speak to that sort of perfect, you know, locally driven, seasonally driven cut flower. Dahlias are tubers, so they'll, they'll look kind of like potatoes, essentially, um, when you get them in a way. Um, they, uh, if you haven't bought these yet, you probably can still go to your garden center and find them, um, but they also are available for mail order. And there, again, you can see from this image, just the rainbow of color options available. They are really, really fun. Um, dahlias, I, you know, do the same thing as I mentioned with those other perennials, nipping off that top growing point. Um, when they're about six to eight inches tall for that same reason. It'll encourage branching, it'll keep the plants a bit more squat so they won't flop over as much and you'll get more flowers out of it in the end. Dahlias also appreciate lots of nutrients, lots of fruit, um, you know, incorporate a lot of uh, organic matter into your soil before planting. Um, and another important safety tip here is that dahlias in particular, um, oh, what was I gonna say? Uh, it'll come back to me, but I had one more thing. To, uh, oh, soil temperature. So, and you'll probably see this when you are um, either ordering online again or buying in your local garden center that soil temperatures need to be a certain temperature before you put these in the ground for them to really succeed. You know, it may not kill them if it's in the 50s, but we really want it to be, um, you know, a little warmer in order for them to really take off. And I don't remember the, the temperature number right offhand, but something to check into. Because um, again, we can, you know, these can arrive, we can be super excited, but if we're too eager and we plant too soon, it'll slow them down. Or again, if we have a freak late season frost on May 14th, um, that could do them in. So you can those pot these up indoors if you have some leftover containers and pots and some extra soil. You can get these started if you have like a sunroom or a sunny garage window or anything like that. You can pot them up in advance. Um, you know, my, my mail order ones are arriving next week actually. So I might pot these up 
keep them indoors for maybe a month and a half, month or so, um, and then actually plant them out maybe closer to the beginning of June once I definitely know the soil is warm enough, we're into warmer days and I've had time to fully amend my soil. So again, dahlias, I would say are not for the faint of heart in this way. Again, they do take a lot of sort of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, finessing and, and sort of um, really all sort of annual seasonal cut flowers do, um, you know, be, you know, being able to commit the time to regularly cutting them, you know, you certainly again can grow these just as a nice garden plant, but even if we're growing them not for cutting, but just for outdoor display, um, deadheading, which is essentially what we're doing when we're, we're harvesting cut flowers, you know, removing the spent blossoms is still important and that will help to keep the display coming and keep the plant to uh, help it encourage, encourage it to keep producing flowers. So this is a really fun one that I think, um, you know, definitely deserves more space in our gardens these days. This is actually related to the gladiola, which is again, probably something that a lot of us have seen a lot and pardon the dogs in the background. Um, you know, gladiolas are probably something that you've seen a lot in the farmer's market. Um, again, in high summer, those sort of big columns of tubular flowers, lots of colors available. But acidanthera is a really fun one because it's just so delicate. You know, it's not necessarily as bulky or heavy as those traditional gladiolas are, but these are still a, to uh, a tender bulb in a corm. So these need to go in each spring again, once the temperatures have warmed up enough, and then also dug up in the fall and brought in to overwinter. So these are not things that can you know, stay in the garden all year round like daffodils or tulips would, you know, daffodils and tulips can stay in all the time. These do need to be brought in or again, replanted fresh every year. All right, now we're going to move into sort of our final movement here, which is looking at native, um, mostly native perennials here, a few natives, a few not natives, but looking at perennials that again can sort of help to fill out our bouquets throughout the year, but especially sort of in this um, spring moment when the annuals aren't quite blooming yet. The first is Baptisia, and this is uh, uh, false indigo is the common name for this one. This is a native prairie plant for us. So it is, it has a very beefy, big root system. Um, so it will take a couple of years to get fully, you know, this plant that you're looking at here is uh, at least four to five years old, maybe a bit more. Um, so it will take time to get up to this size, but once it's here, it'll do this every year for you, like clockwork, it, you know, I almost, even though they're technically perennials, I treat them like shrubs because of you know the the volume they take up. These these are probably uh, four feet tall if you include the flower spikes and just as wide for potentially one plant. Um, again, this is a very mature plant. Um, but Baptisia is in the bean family, so it is a nitrogen fixer. So it's related to things like peas um, in the uh, yeah in the bean family in the pea family. Um, these flowers again cut great, work well in vases. Um, and the other reason I love this plant is even when it's done flowering, the seed heads have interest. The seed pods again kind of look like over swollen beans because again they're in the bean family. Those can be cut and look great in an arrangement, but also the leaves. These leaves are amazing as filler in, in late summer bouquets. So if you, you know, have a big say clump of zinnias that you want to put into a vase, but you need just a little more green to sort of break things up a little bit. Baptisia is an amazing candidate to do this. There's, you, you can cut pretty heavily on these leaves and not harm the plant. You know, I would say you usually aim for about 30% if you're going to be harvesting leaves. Anything more than that, and you might, you might be taking something away from the plant. But again, 30% of all of these stems is a lot of greenery. Aringium, this is our native rattlesnake master. And this one actually blooms later into the summer. Again, probably uh, late June, July is when this really comes into its own. But it is just, I mean, it's just extremely cool. Sort of these, you know, white, you know, pin cushion like flowers. Pollinators go nuts for this one, you know, especially things like bumblebees and wasps, which really need support. Um, and again, you could only harvest maybe 30% of the flowers and leave the rest for the wildlife. So this is something where you can enjoy it yourself um, by bringing it indoors, but also it's doing good for your sort of local ecology as well. In all cases, these perennials are typically really well adapted to a range of site conditions. And so they, you know, once they're established, shouldn't need a lot of water, shouldn't need a lot of compost unless we have extreme droughts. Um, but these aren't plants that take a lot of, you know, massaging quite so much as the annuals and the tender bulbs would. Calament. So this is um, a, another, it's in the mint family, of course, and it's sort of the white cloud here that we're seeing. Don't be scared by the word mint. Again, I know a lot of people, if you've ever grown, especially the culinary mint, sort of, you know, you might recoil a little bit um, because 
that culinary mint can really take over if, if it's not watched. You know, it sends out sort of those lateral, um, those spreading roots, and it can just sort of start to pop up everywhere. Calamint is unique in that it doesn't do that. So when it uh, emerges in spring, it's a perfect green sphere. It almost look, looks like a clipped boxwood topiary. Um, it's, it has such an interesting, cool look uh, early in the season. But then as it begins to flower later in the summer, again, probably around July, it sort of unfurls into these you know, beautiful white clouds that again, A, if you're trying to support pollinators, this is an amazing choice. So it literally, when it's in full bloom like this, it, if you walk by at any point in the summer, it'll just, it's sort of vibrating. Um, there's so many insects and different creatures on it. Um, it also is aromatic. So of course, again, being a mint, especially when the sun hits it and, it and it is at the peak of the day or late in the day, you know, plant this near your patio or your deck or, you know, so where you open a window because it will exude that minty fragrance. And so you will actually smell that mint, um, you know, just naturally, whether you bring it inside or not, it's a great plant. Um, and again, it loves hot, dry, full sun, lean soil. So it's a plant kind of like lavender and others that just like thrives on neglect. So it also is the uh, perennial plant of the year this year in 2021. So it should be pretty readily available in most garden centers. You know, this shouldn't be too hard to find if you're looking to grow some. And the other thing I'll mention is that it literally grows or blooms, you know, in terms of, you know, most perennials we might again get three to four weeks of interest out of. This will bloom from again, probably early to mid-July through frost. It will just, it'll just keep putting out bud or blossoms. So it's something that you can come back to and harvest many times. Again, just being mindful not to totally harvest all of it and you know, sort of scalp the plant, leave it, you know, harvest about 30% is the rule of thumb to look for. Allium, this is another one, pairs really wonderfully with the calamint actually. They bloom at the same time. They're both favorites of pollinators. Again, a lot of us, this is an ornamental onion. So, you know, it doesn't, um, unlike the allium, or I'm sorry, unlike the mint, it doesn't necessarily exude that beautiful minty fragrance. Um, but even cutting these, it's, you're, you know, your kitchen's not gonna smell like onions and garlic. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, but again, these are hardy perennials. They will come back year after year. And these bloom later in summer as well. You know, I think most of us are familiar with the um, spring blooming allium that we plant as bulbs in the fall. They will bloom around May to June. And, you know, once they're done, the foliage just, it, everything goes dormant and it kind of melts away. The nice thing with these allium is that the foliage is already up, you know, six inches in my garden. Um, so it has something interesting to look at with all of the greenery. Um, and then of course, the, uh, when the flowers do emerge, it's a really wonderful thing, um, you know, throughout the summer. And so these again will bloom July through early August. It's an extended bloom. You can cut, again, ex you could cut all of these flowers off actually because you're not cutting off any leaves when you do this. You know, the calamint is the exception because the leaves and the flowers are sort of all together. The allium, the stems and the leaves again are very separate. So you could harvest these without to 100%, take all the all the flowers and leave the leaves and not do any harm to the plant. So that is what we have for sort of the formal presentation. So now we're going to go ahead and open it up to any questions that came in while we were chatting here um, and any questions maybe that came in in advance or from previous sessions. So Jack, I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, I just want to say that made me really excited because first of all, everything was so beautiful and it's also kind of uncanny how much you just walked through my own garden. Um, really everything except for the snapdragons are things that I'm growing. So I um, especially am very fond of growing the dahlia. I've been doing it for about five years now and they really never cease to amaze me. I kind of went into it with this sort of fear of them that they would require a great amount of attention and care. And I think that they do, but also they've surprised me. And, you know, I left um, a bulb in the ground and the next thing I know I have a flower. So um, I don't know, you know, sometimes it just, sometimes you just get lucky, but yep. very much one, thing I, to, yeah, <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you about Dahlia um, is even though I love them, um, they are very strong attractors to Japanese beetles. And, um, you know, usually I just use that um, <clears throat> allure bag um, to kind of get as many as I can, but I also heard that that's not really the best way to go about it. So I was wondering if you had a more sustainable approach that does not require me to put my fingers on them. Yes. Um, so 
Yeah, the allure, and you're correct, that allure bag is essentially the, I, I believe it's pheromones or something that they use in there to sort of attract them. And, you know, the irony is, well, yes, you're killing them as they go inside, but you're also attracting more. So it's kind of a, yeah. um, a double-edged, you know, it's, it's almost a placebo of a treatment or, or something. So what I've actually found to work pretty well, and again, yeah, touching them is not fun. I completely agree. Um, if you go, you can go and buy just a, a battery powered dust buster for like 20, 30 bucks at Target or wherever and vacuum them off. So, and then all you do is you just sort of empty your dust buster, you empty it into a bucket of soapy water and that will take them out and leave them in there for, again, a day or something like that. You can dump it on your compost pile. They'll just rot away and, you know, enrich your garden for future years. But you get yeah. short of spraying chemicals and other things on, on them, which, you know, if you're gardening organically, we don't want to do um, that sort of physical removal. And, and then you don't have to, again, sit there and pick at them and have them crawl up your arms. You just yeah. go out and vacuum the garden once or twice a week. <laughs> so Absolutely. The, the Allure bag is so powerful that when you open it up, even before I could hang it on the tree, my arm was covered with them. Ooh, so yeah. It's just like, you know, they really dig the pheromone. Um, but I don't particularly enjoy them. So... And and the other thing I'll mention for Japanese beetles too, because this is something that I think, again, we're, we all deal with, um, you know, they, uh, they don't just show up, they actually come from our lawns. So the grubs will overwinter, you know, if you get to, especially to late summer and you start to have dead spots in your lawn or, or brown spots, that probably means you have a very healthy Japanese beetle population. Um, and they can live into sort of normal garden soil too, but especially in lawns. So I've been in the process of tearing up my front lawn to plant a new garden because we just got a new house. And as I've been removing this turf, I mean, they've just been, I just, just, it's, it's, it's unnerving how dozens I found in a really, really small space. Um, wow, okay, I and, didn't know that. That's good to know. So, you know, that's sort of yet one more reason to think about downsizing our lawns is that that is essentially, you know, if we had fewer lawns, we would have fewer Japanese beetles because that, those are an essential piece of their life cycle is, is living overwintering in that space. Um, and then of course we have to deal with the grub damage to our lawn and sort of all of those things. So one more reason to downsize lawn, um, there is a, a, a natural pest control method out there called milky spore, I believe. Um, again, you should be able to find it in most garden centers, but it's just, it's, it comes as a powder. You sort of um, dab it onto your, or sort of every, I think three, there's the package instructions will, will say for sure, but I want to say it's like every three to four feet in sort of a grid pattern. You can apply that to your turf and it doesn't have an immediate effect because again, it isn't a, a toxic chemical. It's sort of a natural um, sort of fungal bacteria that essentially will kill the and eat the grubs over time. But it takes, I believe, maybe two to three years to fully infiltrate and go through our entire lawn. But that's one way again to sort of, um, you know, of course, if you have neighbors and they have lawns and they don't do this, Japanese beetles can come from your neighbors. But in terms of your own space, there are some things we can do to sort of mitigate um, the beetle spread for sure. Great, well, that's great ideas there. Um, I really liked the Baptisia and the Calament that you pointed out, those were new to me. Um, but I also did notice that um, it seems like everything um, is very heavy, full sun. Is there any sort of cut flower that we could grow if we have more shade? Yeah, I, I mentioned hostas briefly, you know, those are probably your best choice for high summer, I would say just to, and again, like all shapes and colors and sizes for the leaves. Um, I wouldn't say they're the best. I mean, you certainly could cut the flowers, um, but I think the leaves are probably where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in shade. Um, Japanese Hakoni grass, which is, and I'll drop this in the chat. Um, uh, Zirconi? Yep, with H-A-K-O-N-E. Oh, okay. um, and so... Uh, yeah, that is another one where it's it's fairly thin fronds, but they they come in sort of a chartreuse gold. They come in more of a sort of a solid, just forest green. You know, for, for shade gardening, I think there's less in the way of flowers and more of the way, of, again, greens and cut foliage that you would, textures that you'd be using probably more than flowers. Um, very late in the season, you know, probably high to midsummer, most shade gardens are just greens. But if you are growing some native plants like um, white snake root, which could be, now that has a fragrance that isn't exactly appealing, um, but they have sort of these long white, uh, they almost look like cattails, uh, like actual cats, not the cattail plant, but um, sort yeah. of these long sinewy white blooms, again, great for pollinators. They don't produce, um, established plants can produce a lot of flowers, um, but they have really nice sturdy stems that you could cut well. 
And there are some sort of woodland edge plants like goldenrods and uh, coneflowers that if you have partial sun, those you could get away with and those might cut well too. Okay, great. Um, now, I don't know if, uh, you know, I'm, this is kind of probably its own topic, but what would you say about roses? Um, you know, I think a lot of people have the perception that they're super challenging. Would you, you know, to begin with, would you say that? Yeah, yes. Um, yes, I, I'll be frank, I'm not a huge rose fan um, because they, you know, we really don't have a great climate to grow roses here um, in terms of our, our temperatures. Again, things like the pests that we have to deal with. Um, if you're going to do roses, I typically try to lean towards our native roses, like the rugosas. Um, you know, they're not the big, big showy flowers like we might traditionally think of as a rose, but they're far better adapted to sort of our, you know, they're, they're native. So there are, are, and a lot of them are single form, which again, are really beautiful. I don't necessarily think they'll hold up great in a vase, but I think they're a lot more forgiving when it comes to sort of how they will perform for us. Yeah, I know I've had, um, you know, some rough goes of it. I've tried two different rose bushes. None of them have taken and uh you know then like a very um manufactured climbing rose and that didn't even take off either so i guess they're just not really um easy you know in this particular climate but i know a lot of people like them and love them so i thought it was worth asking what if um let's just have an imaginary situation where someone lived next to a property that was blighted and you heard that this person was thinking about scattering sunflowers throughout that property. What would you recommend to that person? Like, could they just throw the sunflower seeds right over the fence? Before I get to that really quick, I noticed Maggie asked in the chat about sourcing Baptisia roots. I just wanted to get to her really quick. Um, oh, so for Maggie, uh, Maggie, or in the q and I should say. Um, oh, gotcha. Uh, so Maggie, for those, yes, for, for sourcing Baptisia, um, you know, most garden centers most probably, garden you'll, probably, you'll probably buy them as actual plants, not necessarily the rootstock. Um, and uh, if you can also mail order them as well. So Prairie Nursery, which again is, is a Wisconsin-based uh, native plant nursery, those you should be able to order plugs or sort of larger gallon size plants from. Um, and then the Flower Factory in Stoughton should also have, um, they're doing, uh, they're not open for traditional retail, but you can place orders online for curbside pickup. And so they um, they might have some available as well. They're great. Yeah, that, that's a good spot. Okay, so your, your sunflower question. So you were saying there's sort of a yeah, how much um, scenario of a vacant lot that you're trying to, or thinking about scattering sunflowers? No, that someone I know is. And, okay. And so, I mean, you know, how much care do they need? Are they sturdy enough to toss and walk away or you know, would that person have to scale the fence and then go like step on them? You know what I actually might do if it depends on how long they want, if it's just sort of a one year, like, hey, let's beautify this and bring attention to it. Um, yeah, you could certainly do the annual sunflowers. Um, if you can find the shorter variety, I mean, really, it, you know, it's the, 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 the note, the idea that they can flop over is really more when they don't have natural support around them. So if they're growing through, uh, you know, shrubs and other plants and other sunflowers to lean on, that's going to, first of all, help to sort of, you know, if there are high winds or rain that come through that, if they have things to lean on, that helps a lot. You know, in our sort of traditional gardens, if we're growing just sunflowers in a row and there's nothing nearby, that's when they're more prone to just sort of flop over than if they have support. And that's true of really any plant. Um, if they have support nearby to lean on, then that's 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 an awesome place to be. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I would say is if this is, is a lot that is might be vacant for a while, there's also perennial native sunflowers um, that, again, may take a couple of years to get up and rolling. But in fall, it would just be this cacophony of yellow. Um, and again, great for pollinators, great for great as a native plant um, and extremely well adapted, durable, sturdy, all of those things. Awesome. That sounds really good. I will. I will pass that along. Um, let's see. Um, we have another question about, well, I think it's very similar. Um, yeah, it's totally, what, what are your thoughts about guerrilla gardening? I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's high risk. Like you don't really know what you're, you know, going to do to wherever you're targeting. So I know we used to have at the co-op this little gumball machine that sold seed balls, mm -hmm. which I thought was, you know, 
kind of walking the line. <laughs> so, um, and, you, you know, about- I personally am, fr- frankly, I'm a fan of guerrilla gardening because I think, um, and I think it's, it, and it, I will say, you know, obviously it's a use your best judgment kind of moment. Like if, if you're, uh, you know, do a little background and research, you know, what might be happening on the site you wanted to work with. Um, you know, is there, it, you know, sometimes if, it, if it's something where, you know, maybe it's somebody would like to do something and either can't afford it or just hasn't gotten around to it, they may really welcome the help if you reach out to them. Um, but if it's something where, you know, you know that, it, again, no one's really paying attention to it, nothing's really happening. I've seen people go out and plant flowers in potholes to draw attention to yeah. road repairs, you know, like gorilla yeah. gardening can take all kinds of shapes and forms, which is what's so wonderful about it. But I mean, I think if anything, it's a beautiful form of protest and renewal. So I don't think, you know, it's yeah. like, not, as long as you're not harming anything or like breaking down buildings. I mean, if you're just yeah. beautifying spaces that need some love, that's a, you know, wonderful sure. thing. And, and not, you know, targeting other gardens. So. Right. Yeah. Don't go over to your neighbors and be like, I don't like what you did. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I guess to like kind of close it out, um, there's an interesting kind of, you know, before and after sort of question, which is, um, you know, what are your recommendations for, you mentioned like having good compost, but do you have any recommendations for uh, food that could be added to soil? And then um, at the end, um, what about vase additives? Are there any things that you would recommend putting in our vases to prolong the life of what we cut? So before and after. Totally. Um, you know, for soil additives, the probably the really the best advice is just sort of good wet wet, mature compost um you know if you can get your hands on like cow manure that's been well aged you know that's also black gold i mean that's beautiful um but beyond that in terms of like specific mineral additives that's where if you got a soil test um specific like if you're noticing that your plants and the and especially if you, you know if you're doing vegetables for the first time i definitely recommend a soil test just to know if there's any toxic materials in your soil um but for cut flowers obviously you're not eating them so it's a little bit less unless you're noticing your plants just really struggling for some reason I, uh, that would be like leaf discoloration they they're super stunted they're not growing well um, you know you know it's a water issue if they're wilting you know frequently you have to, you're finding your soils drying out and that's typically going to happen with you know sandy gravelly well-drained soil of course um, but uh, beyond that um, again I would only then I would say do a soil test if you're noticing your plants not performing or really something seems off. And then that will come back and say, oh, you may need to add this mineral or this specific additive. Um, but sort of as just a general like plant food. Um, oh, the other thing I'll actually say that I have yet to try personally, I want to try it, but I've seen it a lot is comfrey. And comfrey is a perennial herb, C-O-M-F-R-E-Y, um, that essentially absorbs a lot of micronutrients from the soil and it holds it in its leaves. And so if you have a stand, you know, and it can just sort of grow along edges and in sort of places that are harder to grow other plants, frankly, um, it's a really great source of organic nutrients. And so you can, you can, you can use it in a few ways, um, either just cut the leaves down to the ground um, and spread it over the top of your soil as a mulch and let them decompose. Um, And by the way, comfrey has such a beefy big root system that like, you know, I know I said don't harvest too, but like just harvest it for comfrey, (laughs) like it, it won't mind. Um, you know, you can do one of those heavy cuts at least per year and just cut it all down again, maybe in June-ish, I want to say late May, early June. Um, if it does, if you do allow it to bloom, the bumblebees really enjoy it. Um, but you can also make comfrey tea out of it. And so this is where you take those leaves, put it in a bucket, put some weight on it, like some old bricks or some rocks to keep it from floating up to the top. Um, and then you sort of let it steep for, I don't remember, it'll be a couple of weeks, I think. I don't remember how long, but it, like fair warning it smells awful like it's don't put this in don't put this in your kitchen don't put it in your porch um put it somewhere out of the way that you don't have to look at it um once it's ready uh you'll strain out the leaves those leaves can just hit the compost because now all the great stuff that was in those is in that tea and then that's actually a concentrated solution so you would dilute it before you put it on your plantings you don't want to apply it straight because it's so much packs a punch um, I've seen comfrey food or sort of comfrey feed used uh, around tomatoes a lot, um, and again in, in veggie plantings. But I think it certainly could be used for cut flowers. And again, if you just grow your own row of comfrey somewhere, 
you'll have sort of your own built-in stash organic fertilizer forever. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds great. I've not heard of that. I'm excited to research it. Good. It's it, yeah, it's a fun plant. Yeah. Great. And then um, so now what about the vase? Oh, the vase, yes. Um, you know, there are different additives, you know, the, I, I don't know how much of this is sort of a, um, an urban myth versus reality. I've heard just table sugar, can, like a pinch of sugar can sometimes help. Um, mm. I, again, I don't know how much of that's scientifically proven. I'd have to look into that. Um, I, I do think some vase additives do help um, just in terms of some of them include sort of things to help the plant stay hydrated. Cause that's the yeah. biggest thing. Like, you know, even when you have them in a vase of water, if they can't take up water in quite the same way. It just doesn't do them any good. Um, but of course, they've also been cut off from nutrients. So they, you know, the more that we can mimic them still being attached to a plant without being attached to a plant, the better. Um, yeah. Well, do you know, you know what it, is in that, like if I buy some, a bouquet of flowers at, you know, wherever, what is in the little packet they give you? I actually don't know. I wish I, you know, it's something I want to look into because I don't know for sure. I don't think it's anything super terrible that, that I would, that I can, you know, like harsh chemicals by any means, but I've also never really looked into it. So I, I can't say for sure, but it's something probably worth looking into. Yeah. I know there's the, uh, the baby aspirin myth out there too. I, well, I don't want to say myth cause I've never done it. So I don't know, but all right. Well, um, let's see anybody in our Q and a have any final thoughts or questions, Maggie, Michelle. No. This has been great, Ben. Thank you so much for all of this cool information. And absolutely really makes me excited for the next coming weeks because things are going to start kicking. So finally, yes, it's yes. been a long, well, spring is, it's been a, it's been a gentle spring, which is good, but like, yeah, a little warmth would not be, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> yeah, we could, we're ready for it. So, well, thank you for um, the whole series. It's been really informative and we're going to have it recorded, make it available through our uh, social media so folks can go back and, and tap into it whenever they need. Um, there might be one more thing that came in the Q&A. Uh, nope, it's some thanks from our, our attendees today. Um, yeah, so, and we'll share um, more information about your program, uh, Let's Grow Stuff, uh, there as well, so people can kind of follow up with you. But thank you for uh, being our, our guide. Absolutely happy to do it. Feel free to reach out with questions anytime, anyone, and happy gardening. Thank you to you. Bye-bye. Take, Take care. Bye-bye.